The first question that uh, has been posited has to do with the situation between two brethren, one uh, who has been accused of being an offender of the other. And uh, the question has actually come in from the ostensibly offending party who has tried to appeal to the offended party to solve the dispute between themselves, to work it out amicably and uh, in keeping with New Testament teaching. The uh, uh, basic question comes down to, to this, and as much as the offended party uh, uh, mentioned some terms, mentioned uh, things that uh, supposedly the offender did or said concerning himself, uh, but will not give the how, when, wherefore, the, the details, so that the offender can reference in his own mind, can go back and think about what he said, when he said it, why, and what was the circumstances, or even look at uh, any materials he might have pertaining to that. Uh, then, and as the offended party has said, I don't want any more contact from you. What can the offender do to try to solve the matter biblically? Uh, basically nothing other than simply pray for the offended, uh, the offer whatever uh, apology can be offered within a reasonable uh, aspect of things without knowing the details. You don't even know what you're apologizing for. The text that deals with the matter of personal offenses uh, is Matthew chapter 18, 15, and following. And that requires or makes it incumbent upon the offended party to go to the offender to work it out. Now, certainly, if an individual knows he has transgressed against someone, he ought to repent of that, confess it, ask for forgiveness. And I would argue that that is involved in James 5.16 and other such passages. But as far as this particular situation where you have details that the party who's been accused of causing the offense doesn't recall the details, doesn't know the circumstances or situation uh, because it happened some time back, then the offender or the offended party uh, should... Uh, in the proper spirit, bring these things to the attention of the offender, lay out uh, his case, and then let them discuss it as Christians should, and uh, go from there. But as long as he's unwilling to do that, uh, there's not really much the uh, person accused of causing the offense can do about it on that end of it. And... Uh, how do you defend charges that you don't even know what the charges are against charges that uh, you don't even know the circumstances, conditions, and so on? Uh, I'm sure at different times uh, we have been involved in situations in family units as well as uh, on the job or in other situations where you don't really know all the details. Uh, that uh, may be involved, you said something and uh, it was taken in the wrong way or what have you. And uh, the full details on both parties simply uh, are not known. Until all the facts are laid on the table and evidently the facts here uh, are those that, uh, or at least the pertinent facts, the immediately pertinent facts, pertain to the offended party. And if he's not willing to share that and to lay that out and where a defense can be made or some type of, of discussion take place, then uh, basically uh, the problem falls on the offended in this case. The, that there is a problem with the party who is claiming to be offended 
uh, in not wanting to just work this out on that end of it. And, and the, th the thing is, he may have a good reason, a good case as to why he feels offended. That's not the issue. The issue right now is how do you go back and rework the situation and work it out between the two parties with a proper Christian attitude uh, on the part of both. If one's not willing to talk, isn't willing to lay out his case, then the other's pretty much in limbo on that end of things and all he can do is take the matter to, to the Lord in prayer and, you know, and do it on that basis. And when there's an opportunity, then, Brother Mike, I have knowledge of the specific situation, so uh, I can understand a little bit about it. But uh, one other aspect that Daniel didn't bring out, the offended party has blocked any communication from That's right. the offender. And it was by way of a third party that the offending party even found out that there was a problem. And so when he tries to write to him, email him, and say, let's work this out, I don't even remember it, but uh, he just rejects it and says, I'm blocking you. There's not going to be any communication that I will receive from you. There's nothing you can do. I'm reminded of a statement Brother Gus Nichols used to sometimes make, and he said, brethren, he said, when the Bible says that we're to be as children, he didn't say to be, to be childish. <laughs> we need to recognize the difference between the two. Uh, I can understand being offended by something somebody says and being hurt. And, uh, and as a result, you've, you're skittish about it. But uh, we also need to be honest with one another and forthright. That doesn't mean that we have to be hateful or mean-spirited or anything, but at any event. There also needs to be the attitude of I want to work it out. Um, yes. You know, it, we might offend someone. I mean, probably we all have at some point in time and not even know it. Unless they're willing to let us know and work it out, what can we do? Mm -hmm. We try and do our best. But uh, there's nothing that we can do if we don't even know about it. That was the situation on this. He didn't even know about it for a few years. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. This was something that happened a couple of years ago in a Facebook group. And finds out about it. He tries to make it right. I will not receive any more communication from him. And blocks him. So... Uh, yes, it had been going on that long, a couple of years. So, but there needs to be that attitude. If someone offends me, I need to go to them. Uh, I think we've lost that a lot of times within the church. Uh, and there needs to be a part on the, the one who has caused the offense to have that desire to work it out as well, on both parts. I think it's something that we need to give greater consideration to. Yeah, how many troubles are caused within a congregation because someone gets offended at someone else and yet they won't tell anyone about it. Or they won't tell, or they'll go tell someone else but they won't tell the person they've offended. Jess Whitlock, Morton Street, Church of Christ, Denison, Texas. In this text of Matthew 18, 15, uh, we need to emphasize in our teaching and in our preaching uh, that Jesus Christ said between thee and him alone. And I like to encourage people to highlight or circle that word alone. I, if you do your math, only count two people. <laughs> Amen. And, and I teach and I preach that if anybody beyond those two people learn anything about that situation, Sin has entered the picture, and that sin needs to be taken care of. When I was laboring with the Lord's Church in Blanchard, Oklahoma, 
It was February, very cold. We had snow on the ground, sub-freezing temperatures. We had our monthly fellowship meal after the evening service. Well, I would go to the office that afternoon and study uh, until it was service time. There were two ladies in that congregation. They were sisters in Christ as well as uh, physical sisters. And they would come to the building on those Sundays. They would prepare the cups and the plates and lay out all of the uh, silverware and what have you to get ready for our fellowship meal together. They would always uh, start out in the kitchen and fix coffee, especially when it was snowing outside. And uh, I would walk in the kitchen and I would grab a glass of iced tea. I am a teaaholic. <laughs> and uh, I love my tea, so I, I, I went in and I'm fixing my glass of iced tea. And these two sisters asked me, said, Brother Whitlock, coffee's just about ready. Don't you want to wait and have a, have a hot cup of coffee? And I smiled at them and said, no thanks, I'm a Christian. And I walked back to my office. <laughs> <laughs> Never gave it a second thought. And fellowship meal that evening went great. Monday went fine. And it's Tuesday night. And the phone rings at the house. I pick up the phone. And it's one of these sisters in Christ. And she says, Brother Whitlock, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm dying for a cup of coffee. <laughs> and I said, well, are you out of coffee? I can go get you some coffee. She said, no, I have all kinds of coffee in the house, but I'm trying to give it up. I said, well, why are you trying to give it up? She said, since I learned it was a sin. <laughs> and I said, well, who in the world told you it was a sin? <laughs> drink coffee. It took me 10 minutes to convince her that I was only kidding when I said what I said that Sunday. I had no idea. And she said, you mean I can really have a cup of coffee? <laughs> and I said, yes, ma'am, you can. She said, bye. Yeah. <laughs> Brother, Guy, Brother Guy in Woods was with a group of preachers in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, many years ago, and they were at a restaurant, and the waitress asked each individual what they wanted to drink, and one young preaching student uh, kind of snapped that uh, he didn't drink coffee because he was a Christian. And Brother Woods remarked, he says, I am too, but I don't let it make a fool out of me. <laughs> and he ordered his cup of coffee. Harold Davidson, I preach at Hornbeak, Tennessee. This is a sad statement. I don't remember what it was that I offended a brother in Oklahoma. I learned that he was offended. And I went to him. I said, I beg your forgiveness. He looked at me straight in the face. He said, I will not forgive you. A little later, now, we had moved, as I recall, but a little bit later, I heard of his death. That's on his shoulders. Amen. I begged him for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. He said, I will not. I'll never forget it. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that type of attitude, he's not going to be forgiven. That's what Jesus taught. All right, the next question. Uh, do Christians go to paradise in Hades when they die, or do they go directly to heaven? Well, I believe uh, from Luke chapter 16, uh, verses 19 and following, that they go directly uh, or go to paradise and Hades, also called Abraham's bosom. Now, Brother Gus Nichols and Brother Woods for many, many years discussed this back and forth at Freed Hardeman and various other venues, but especially the Freed Hardeman Forum. Brother Woods held that uh, the righteous dead go directly to heaven. And I remember Brother Woods in one of his last appearances at Freed where he was operating the open forum. This is after the passing of Brother Nichols. And he was going over this same point again. And Brother uh, Woods, uh, as he uh, would do, laid out Brother Nichols' case for him. Brother Nichols wasn't there. But he, he said, this is what Brother Nichols would say. And he said, this is what I would say. And said, and now, and now you know Brother Nichols has uh, 
passed on and gone on to his reward. And now he knows better. <laughs> so that's how he would, how he would end it. But uh, the, uh, do they go to paradise or do they go directly to heaven? Now, the passage Brother Nichols would use, of course, uh, was Ephesians chapter 4. This is uh, the key text that he would base his argument on. Verse 8, referring to the ascension, Wherefore he saith, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. And the translation of that phrase, captivity captive, is it referring to captivity itself, or as the marginal reads in many uh, Bibles, uh, a multitude of captives, or many captives? Is it talking about captivity in the sense of sin, uh, which has held men captive, has now been uh, incarcerated, uh, uh, arrested, uh, restrained, which is what Daniel prophesied would happen, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, to finish the transgression, literally the Hebrew means to restrain, to incarcerate, meaning that uh, sin would be incarcerated by virtue of the atoning work of Jesus Christ. And uh, that this is uh, many commentators, that's the position they hold on this particular passage in Ephesians 4, that it is a reference to the result of the atoning work of Christ. Brother Nichols, however, believed that it referred to the many captives uh, being released and taken to heaven, and those captives being the righteous in the Hadean realm, particularly in the in paradise or in Abraham's bosom. And that was the position he holds. And there are some good brethren that still hold that view. And uh, in fact, I think Brother Kent Bailey is one that affirms that. And uh, there are others uh, that hold it. Is it a, a matter of faith that you uh, hold to one or the other? I don't believe so. Uh, it wasn't between Brother Nichols and Brother Woods. Uh, and, uh, and I believe they had a proper attitude on the matter. Now, here's the next question, because I believe, I, I think I know where this question came from. If one holds to one view or the other, is it a fellowship matter? Well, not if you hold to the views I've just put out. But if you hold to the view that uh, this situation came into existence by virtue of the AD 70 doctrine, yeah, it's a fellowship issue on that end of it. Because the entire purpose of the AD 70 doctrine is to pervert that teaching. And that's different. It's a big difference. Uh, if you notice, during the debate, Holger Neubauer kept talking about how the body of the Old Testament saints was translated or transferred into heaven in A.D. 70. The Bible doesn't teach that garbage. doesn't teach it anywhere, and especially not in Romans chapter 8. It doesn't teach that. But that's what he is trying to do. That is a third doctrine that's brought into the picture that is based on suppositions that themselves are false and implicitly destructive. These brethren have now taken the position that, uh, as you know from the debate and from other things, their own writings, that Jesus spiritually died, that he was separated from the fellowship of God. God the Father and God the Son. In fact, Holger even said that some of the deity of Jesus was absorbed by the Father and the Holy Spirit. Well, all of that is tied in with their particular version of what happened to the Old Testament saints and uh, their A.D. 70 doctrine. If one believes that... Uh, the righteous go to paradise today, he still teaches and still can believe in a future resurrection from the dead, judgment, the ultimate state, yet future, and all of that. Uh, the same is also true of Brother Nichols' position, what he held. 
Such is not true of this AD 70 doctrine. Their position destroys the one hope that Ephesians chapter 4, 4 says we have been called into. And by virtue of destroying that one hope or refuting it or rejecting it, really rejecting it, uh, by rejecting it, uh, it is heretical. <clears throat> Gary Summers, Winter Park, Florida. Um, you may have given that link to a few other people too, where there's a discussion between Steve Baisden and Holger Neubauer about this very matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they take the position that Jesus was in the Hadean world and apparently was still separated from the Father. I say apparently because they don't define it precisely, but that seems to be the implication mm. uh, of that. And uh, that only after that uh, time in the uh, Hadean realm was, did Jesus conquer and come out. And they actually made the statement that in the Hadean realm, you're not in the presence of the Father. Uh, which prompted me to ask the question, well, you mean Abraham had not been in the presence of the Father all that time? Had not uh, been in fellowship then. I mean, or not even in fellowship. Uh, they seem to have a confused theology about what's in the Hadean realm mm. as, as well as what Jesus was doing there. They uh, seem to be implying he was uh, separated from the Father all that time and was fighting against uh, the devil, um, which is not unlike Joyce Myers uh, or Meyer and some other people uh, who take that position today. So, uh, no... Um, the Hadean realm, part of it is in the presence of God, at least, the part uh, that's known as paradise. And uh, Jesus did not go to, to the other part. He went to paradise. That's what he promised the thief. Amen. You'll be with me in paradise. Was that out of God's presence? Well, they would argue that it was, but uh, I don't think the Bible argues that. No, absolutely. The... Uh What's fascinating about this doctrine, uh, they're saying that here you have these Old Testament saints up until A.D. 70 were in paradise, and yet they were out of fellowship with God, with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, for that matter. But they were out of fellowship until they were raised up out of paradise. And... Uh, which means they were still spiritually dead. They were spiritually dead. If they're out of fellowship, they're spiritually dead. And that Jesus was also spiritually dead. Well, that implies the triunity of the Godhead was destroyed. There was no unity between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's destroyed. Well, that's why Holger wound up with this position that uh, the deity of Jesus, or at least some of it, had to be absorbed. Well, if that happened, then he was no longer fully God, and if he was no longer fully God, then he was just man. Well, that's Jehovah's Witness doctrine. He died just a man on the cross. I remember, and it's also somewhat United Pentecostal doctrine. I remember uh, Marvin Hicks and his debate with Brother Woods arguing that when... Uh, uh, Jesus uh, cried, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that was, that, was, uh, uh, that was Christ, the deity, leaving the man, Jesus, leaving the body, the physical body. And so that being the case, just a mere man died on the cross. Uh, nonsense. That's heresy. And, uh, but this is what these fellows are now teaching. Not only that, but both Steve Baisden and Holger Neubauer have just recently uh, issued uh, a video in which both of them make the statement that there were two deaths that Jesus went through. He went through a physical death and spiritual death, and only one of those paid for our sins. And both of them said it was his spiritual death. Now think about the implication of that. His physical death was not involved or did not pay for our sins. 
Well, if that's the case, what does that do to the blood atonement? If physical death wasn't involved at all in paying for our sins, then the blood atonement could not have been involved in paying for our sins. And so Jesus lied when he said that his blood was shed for the remission of sins. And, he li and Paul lied when he said that the church was purchased with the blood of Christ. This is where these fellows are now. On top of that, they've gone to a, a form. <laughs> you will recall the, we were discussing uh, Acts 1, and he, he took the position that uh, uh, Jesus can now be literally seen, visibly, personally seen, and so on. Well, they've taken the position that that relates to the, to the church. You can see Jesus in the church. And yet they're still using the word visibly, personally, uh, and uh, literally to refer to that. Well, what is that, brethren? That's a version of the second incarnation nonsense. That's the idea of the church is the second incarnation of Jesus. The only difference between him and Rubel, between them and Rubel, is they started in AD 70, Rubel goes back to Pentecost. That's the difference. And again, it's pure heresy. There's another question associated with this that I'm going to deal with uh, even though they're separated distance-wise. He said uh, that the question is, why, how does a physical death atone for spiritual sin? Well, number one, the question's not precisely stated. Uh, sin uh, involves both a spiritual and physical element. For example, when you commit fornication, is it just your spirit sinning or is your body pure? I'm almost convinced these brethren are taking that position, that their body is pure even though they commit sin. It's sort of an inverse uh, form of Gnosticism. The old Gnostics taught that the spirit remained pure while the body sinned. These brethren are teaching the body is pure, but the spirit sins, which is, is just nutty, just out and out nutty. The Ephesian or uh, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1 speaks of the filthiness of both what? The spirit and the flesh. The Bible talks about how our conscience is sprinkled, where our hearts are sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies are what? Washed with pure water, Hebrews 10, 22. God was concerned about redeeming the whole individual, not only the spirit, but also the body, saving us. And uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20 makes that very point, that uh, we belong to the Lord both in soul and body. Not just in our body, not just in our soul. He's redeemed all of us and uh, for us to uh, serve. But let, let's just, let's remove the word spiritual. How does a physical death atone for sin? Ask that question. Because God says so. God says so. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10. Now keep in mind, chapter 9, verse 22, the Hebrews writer had said that without the shedding of blood is no remission. And he's making the point that the blood of Christ had to be shed for there to be forgiveness of sin. Now in chapter 10, he says, beginning verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, in view of that, Brother, brother uh, Camp used to say, when you see a wherefore, you need to stop and see what it's there for. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice an offering thou wouldest not, but a what? A body hast thou prepared me. And brother, he's not talking about the church. He's talking about the body, the physical body of Christ. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin... Thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. 
above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. So the second couldn't exist without the first being removed, by the way. By the which will we are sanctified through what? The offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That sounds like a bodily atonement. That sounds like the offering of the body for sin. And so they're the ones with the problem there. Willard Wilson from Crestview, Florida. Just a thought about the Hadean world and Paradise and Tartarus. Before Christ came, God had to, God had to make accommodations for the, for the spirits of man because they could not go to heaven until Christ came. They, had, they were, still had their sins. But the, there's a scripture that says when Christ went into the Hadean world, he destroyed the strong man's house. If he destroyed it, it's not there anymore. Paradise has moved from the Hadean world to heaven where God is. In 1 Corinthians 13, it calls heaven the third heaven, and then in two verses later, it calls it paradise. So paradise can't be in the Hadean world and, and heaven too at the same time. And I got to thinking about the little girl, seven years old, that was by accident was killed in Baker not too long ago. Now that seven-year-old girl probably didn't have any sin, wasn't, a, wasn't accounted for her sins. Did she have to go into the Hadean world or could she have gone on to heaven? If, she could, if you say that she could, go, could have gone on to heaven because she didn't have any sin, then we, a Christian, don't have any sin either in the blood of Christ. So why do we have to go into the Hadean world and wait there for whenever? Why can't we go on to heaven? We've been cleansed from our sin by the blood of Christ. Or what did the blood of Christ do? He destroyed the strong man's house. The devil has no power over our spirit anymore. Thank you. Two things. Number one... Uh, again, the passage you're appealing to would apply to the resurrection and ascension of Christ, not to AD 70. Uh, so you're not dealing with a parallel on that end of things. Number two, in the case of the little girl, what about the, if the little girl died, died seven years old under Judaism? Where'd she go? I would contend she went to paradise in Abraham's bosom. And uh, that that was true under Judaism and uh, true under patriarchy, and so on. Uh, and so is true today. Uh, any other comments? And simply destroying the strong man's house doesn't mean that paradise itself was strong. I, I would contend that paradise was not part of the strong man's house. I'd say there's an assumption there. Michael Hatcher from Pensacola. I think it'd be good to discuss, since the part of that question was dealing with fellowship, what makes something a fellowship issue and what does not, you know, what are things that are not a fellowship issue? Mm -hmm. uh, as, you know, recently in comments that you and I had on John 14, yes. we disagree. It's not a fellowship issue. Absolutely. But what's the difference uh, between something like that and let's say the AD 70 doctrine. What makes an issue a fellowship issue? Okay. Uh, we need to understand the difference between error in general and fatal error. And there's a big difference. Uh, for example, on the matter of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you have good brethren that believe in a personal indwelling, other brethren that believe in indwelling through the Word only. And... Uh, one or the other is correct, ultimately. But uh, is fatal error involved with either position? I don't believe so. Uh, if so, please demonstrate it. But uh, 
So there's a big difference. You can be wrong on a matter of opinion, on a matter of judgment, and uh, yet not be wrong in the sense that your soul's in danger. In fact, tonight I'm going to be speaking on the subject of uh, the new birth. The Bible says that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. Now, do you have a, an opinion or a view that you hold as to why he came to Jesus specifically by night? A lot of people do. Some people are quite forceful about it. But is it a matter of fatal error if you hold a view that just happens to be wrong on it? Will it send your soul to hell if you believe that the reason why he came was because he was fearful of the Pharisees? A lot of people hold that view. There are others that say he came to Jesus by night because that was the most logical time, the, the, the first opportunity he really had, the best opportunity he had, given the occasion. Maybe you hold that view. Well, the fact of the matter is, there could be multiple reasons or only one reason, or it could be that's just the way it worked out. And so, whatever view you hold could be right or could be wrong. We don't know. But to try to bind that view, that's where you overstep authority. We can have differing opinions on matters of indifference, but when it comes to matters of difference, we have to be in, in unison. We have to be united. And we can hold differing views on certain things and yet not be guilty of teaching uh, inherently fatal doctrine. I contend the AD 70 doctrine is inherently fatal doctrine. Now, I think that was demonstrated in the last two debates. When an individual denies a plain clear, I, you can't get much clearer than Acts 1 verses 9 through 11. This is literal language. It's historical prose. He's coming back the same way he left. That's the force of the Greek. For someone then to take that passage and try to interpret it in such a way that they totally get rid of Jesus coming back in a literal fashion, just as that passage teaches, is direct. They, he may as well stand up and deny that Nicodemus came to see Jesus by night, period. It's the same equivalent. Uh, Gary Summers, Winter Park, Florida again. The uh, uh, one clue as to whether you can remain in fellowship is if one group starts saying this is the way it has to be and starts dividing brethren all over the country. That's a clue that it's not a matter of no consequence. And we have people who simply will not take no for an answer. Jesse talked about some of them this morning. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> but uh, uh, another point is uh, on the argument that is used for uh, the father and the son being out of fellowship, being uh, Jesus' question, why have you forsaken me? If you go back to the Psalms and see where that originates from, that's simply God is not taking action. Why, why are you so far from me? Why are you ignoring me? Uh, why am I not delivered? Uh, these questions come up in that psalm that that question is taken from, as well as other psalms. And it simply means that God has not taken action on, on your behalf at that time. It doesn't mean that you're out of fellowship. How many times have we, as preachers, and heard other preachers through the years, made the statement, referring to that text, it is as though the great God of heaven had to turn his back on his son in order for the process to play itself out. That's what is involved in Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabak, the night. That's the idea. Instead of the father intervening and stopping the process, instead of sending those 12 legions of angels, 
He allowed, or the 10,000 we sing about sometimes, He allowed the process to end. Keep in mind, Jesus Christ was fully God in the sense He had all the attributes of deity, and at the same time He was fully man and He had all the attributes of humanity. And every text that we deal with concerning the nature of Christ has to be uh, harmonized in view of that combination of, of natures. Two natures, one person. And these people do not understand the nature of the, of the incarnation. In relationship to that, I'm Michael Hatcher from Pensacola again. Again. Uh, <laughs> they, of course, during the debate, they tried to put me on their side as far as uh, this idea of spiritual death of Jesus. And the reason being, use the word for so that God forsook Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, and what they did thus is they read into that statement something that's not there. Mm -hmm. And they have put a uh, viewpoint on that word and that idea. And if you use that word, thus it has to be their, their viewpoint. And, and in reality, it's not. As Gary said, it's God's inaction. Mm -hmm. The idea of forsook, in their mind though, you say that word, you automatically believe that God was separated from Jesus from the spiritual sins. And that's begging the question. That's the fallacy of begging the question. It's what they have to prove and they can't prove it. That's right. Uh, all right. <laughs> we have two of them racing for it. So. <laughs> I really want to deal with this one, but we don't. They can handle that tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Harold Davidson, again. Uh, you've caused me to go down memory's roll. <laughs> <laughs> when you get to, when you've been preaching as long as I have, I guess you can do that. Uh, I cannot remember Freed Hardman lecture that I didn't attend from the mid '50s until the first year after Brother Wood's death. And, uh, of course, Brother Nichols had already departed. Um, Brother Woods would bring up the doctrine of the personal indwelling versus dwelling through the word. He would present his case. He said, okay, Brother Nichols, you present yours. They were the closest of friends. One of the pictures on my laptop is a picture of Brother Woods, Brother Nichols, and Brother E.R. Harper coming out of the church building at Henderson. I greatly appreciate that. And I wish I could mimic, uh, by the way, Hebrews 9, 27 on the question, point of man wants to die and after this, the judgment. If we go to heaven, do we have to come out then for judgment? I, well, mm -hmm. this last thing. I wish I could mimic Brother Nichols. Uh, Brother Woods would present his uh, deal on uh, when, when we die, we're going to go to paradise. And Brother Nichols would walk up to the stand where he was about 6'6". Six, six. He said, now, <coughs> Brother Nichols, uh, Brother Woods, when you die, you can go where you want to. When I die, I'm going to heaven. And go to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Carl Ayla from Pensacola. I would just like to make a comment on that beware of people that make fun of the power of God. When Christ came back, and what did he tell Doubting Thomas? Put your hand where? Think about that when Brother mm -hmm. Newbar made fun of God, saying he couldn't bring Christ back with holes in him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, one more question, just very hurriedly. And I know again where this is coming from because it's been asked on the internet a couple of times. Is there ever any justifiable reason for refusing to publicly, publicly debate someone? Yes. Yeah. Many times. For example, if you're dealing with a nut bar. <laughs> why give him a sounding board? Number two, if you're dealing with somebody that's not even representative of anything. Uh, Brother J. Uh, McNutt, many years ago, was confronted with a fellow down in uh, Eagle Lake, Florida, who believed it was a sin to have Bible classes. 
Brother McNutt simply asked him, he said, do, do you represent anybody in this area? And he said, no. He said, sit down. I'll talk with you in private. Uh, I'm not, not going to debate you publicly. Why provide an audience, again, for a nut bar? That's the, yes, there's a very good reason. If you're dealing with someone who, another thing is, if you're uh, uh, dealing with uh, somebody who is uh, patently dishonest and uh, who is going to violate every rule you, you agree to, and we were having some of that, by the way, didn't get as bad as it could have, but there were several rules violated. But uh, then, uh, no, you don't have to debate everybody. There's no, no obligation to do that. There's a variety of ways in which you can answer a false teacher. It's up to the judgment of the individuals involved. Yeah, we appreciate all that. And yes, uh, there are times when you do not debate. It's best not to, and human judgment is certainly involved in that. Uh, sometimes, and sometimes even we make wrong judgments on it, but uh, it is human judgment. Uh, but you don't debate every time you're challenged. Uh, they don't. Yeah, they Otherwise, don't. They, would be, they would debate me right now in writing because all no. of them have a challenge to debate me in writing on their table, every one of them. Yeah, that's another aspect. Um, Why doesn't you it have can, to be uh, oral as opposed to a written? You can make those demands either from oral or writing, both of them. If uh, I must orally debate a person just because they challenge, then would they not be under the same obligation to do a written debate if I challenge them? If not, why not? Uh, but uh, as you see with so many, the legs of the lame are not equal. And a lot of times it is simply they want an audience. Uh, I've made the statement that I do not believe that we should allow or we should debate Bayesden or Neubauer or any of those anymore in a public way. I, that's my opinion. Somebody might disagree, but I think we've given them enough of an audience and we need to deal with them in other ways. Uh, and that might be including a written debate, but uh, from an oral debate, I think we've given them enough of an audience. Appreciate everyone's comments. Let, let me and, say one more thing. Okay. <laughs> On the written debate, you know why they don't want to write a written debate? Number one, their lives will be in print. Number two, they all admit they can't write worth a hoot. <laughs> and if you look at their writing, that's, uh, you can agree with that, isn't that true? <laughs>